More than 500,000 people are living in Thailand who cannot legally call the country their home. They don't have identity cards and can't work, buy property, vote, get married or travel. They're stateless. And according to international law, it's a status that shouldn't even exist. Their plight was highlighted last year when a group of Thai boys were rescued after being trapped in a cave. They became national heroes, even though some of them weren't even recognized by the nation. TRT World's documentary series Off the Grid went to Thailand to understand their story. They live without really existing. More than half a million people are behind these mountains, where very few can see them. They have no citizenship, they, they have no hope. They don't able to dream like other people dream. And they can't get out. Some have become Thailand's national heroes in a country that failed to acknowledge them. The miraculous Thai cave rescue has also brought to light their lack of status. Nobody should left behind because of lack of citizenship. Who are they? And how do they live? This is the story of the people many call the Invisibles. Well, I'm joined now by TRT World Director Producer Mohsin and Naimi, who directed the documentary Off the Grid, Ghost Citizens. And in London is Amal de Chikera, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. Good to have you both on the program. Amal, I'll get to you in a couple of minutes' time, but we've just seen the trailer, Mohsin. It's fascinating that, you know, it's said that they're called the Invisibles. Who calls these people the Invisibles? Well, they call themselves the invisible. All the people I interviewed, they all said that they don't belong to the society, they don't belong to the Thai society, they don't, they like, uh, they legally uh, mm -hmm. don't exist, so they live without really living. The, the problem that they have is that they have many restrictions, uh, they can't work, they can't, uh, they can't uh, marry, they can't vote, they can't buy property, and they can't even travel outside of the province. Mm -hmm. They need a special permit for that, and they live in confined area, mostly in the north, next to the uh, Myanmar border, mm -hmm. and this is why they think they like having some uh, life without really like, you know, being seen. That's why they call themselves the invisible. Right. Let's take a listen to what uh, Vut, uh, one of the characters I interviewed for the documentary, has to say about his life. Okay. ตั้งใจครับแล้วก็อยากอนาคตก็อยากเป็นนักฟุตบอลครับก็เลยตั้งใจใจบอลดีครับอย่างที่ 2 ก็เป็นผลกระทบครับผมก็น้อยใจครับที่แบบไม่ได้ลงบ้างก็เขาจํากัดอะไรแบบนี้ครับก็เลยอยากได้สัญชาติเพื่อมีโอกาสได้เล่น
in this region is not like you know unusual, but the the interesting part is that the uh, the um, this 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 young uh, people uh, when we went there to try to uh, to interview them, we found out that they're not of course the only one. There's mm -hmm. more than a half a million yeah. people living in the northern Thailand, and most of them have the same life as Root or like other people who don't have any chances for the for the same region uh, same um, reason I mentioned earlier. Right. They, right. they they don't have like the same rights. They don't have the same the same the same duties. Yeah, and, and, and the, yeah, there's an NGO, right? Project Justice. There's a, there's a profound point, and I haven't seen all of it. And I'm looking forward to watching it. I promised you I'll watch it. I'll mm. watch all of it. I've seen the trailer and I've seen some clips, right? But there was a profound point one of them made regarding the international attention on them and the semblance of justice that they got for some of them as a result of this. Let's have a little listen. People in this village, they they've been living here for what, well, 80 years, 70 years. And many, uh, one, the first generation, many of them passed away without citizenship, you know. Now the next generation still don't have citizenship that live here. So I really believe they have right to, to live. They have right to have that freedom like other people do. And same right as all other people do. If I was stateless and the children the young people they've been uh, trapped in the cave, uh, got, got given the uh, citizenship. I will, I've been sad. I will be sad because why? You know, do I need to go to the cave and trap in there? Do you have to be a hero to get citizenship, Mohsen? Well, in certain way, yes. Uh, the uh, the wild boar, for example, after they uh, they get rescued, their situ their, situ their status were, was fixed quite quite fast actually mm -hmm. after a couple of weeks the the government gave them documents because they become ambassador of the country they were traveling all over the world uh, to show their resilience and to share their their experience with other young players I'm, I'm speaking about like Argentina or right. Manchester United so in that situation uh, the government has to also avoid some kind of embarrassment because they can't say these children are like you know heroes but in the same way we don't recognize them but uh, there is other people like heroes, which we featured also in the documentary, like one guy um, called Mong. When he was 12 years old, he became origami champion. And then he managed to get to Japan and he won. He won two, uh, two trophies. He came back, he was promised- For Thailand. For Thailand, yes. Right. He was promised citizenship, but he never get it right. until nine years. So during these nine years, Mong couldn't shape his future. He couldn't go you to see. university, for example. Mm -hmm. So he didn't get all the chance to become what he wants to become. So in that situation, Mong was a national hero because right. the entire press knows about him. However, he never gets citizenship until last September because obviously the wild boar case fast track also right. his case. So, and some people are waiting like, you know, until 80 years old because right. when you're not a hero, it's an endless, uh, endless situation. And we witness also some people who've been uh, waiting for citizenship until 80 or 90 right. years old. And of course, so to yeah. answer your question, yes, you're right. You, know, you don't have you to have be to a be hero. hero. You have to right. be a superhero. You have to be a superhero. Let me bring in Amal de Chakera here. Amal, we're discussing statelessness in general and we're going to broaden it out soon and look at different contexts. But is Northern Thailand very unique because it's at a crossroads of different ethnic groups and different nations touching each other? So. The fact that half a million people are stateless is almost the norm for the region because it's Northern Thailand. I mean, uh, yes and no. Uh, I think every country thinks that it is unique in some ways and that exceptionalism does lead to countries treating minorities in particular in a, in a discriminatory manner and excluding them. So what you find in Thailand, you also find in Myanmar with the Rohingya community, for example. You find in the Dominican Republic with ethnic Haitians. Uh, you find in, in Latvia with ethnic Russians. Uh, so there are many countries in which minority communities, communities with a migrant heritage, are deprived of their nationality and made stateless. Uh, and I just wanted to pick up on one point that was made earlier, uh, which is that often what we see is that you have a certain point in history when a group is made stateless uh, or a group fails to access nationality for a range of socio-political reasons. But the reason we still have statelessness in the world today in such large numbers, and my institute estimates numbers to be at around 15 million at least, mm -hmm. is that generation after generation, 
children are born into these communities and they're denied their right to a nationality. And this is an issue that if you look at the international legal framework, there is very clear international standards which set out that every child has a right to a nationality. Right. And that if a child would otherwise be stateless, the country in which the child is born should grant that child nationality. And the failure of states to uphold these obligations is the reason that we have so many millions of stateless people in the world today. Yeah, important point about the generational statelessness. Mohsin, this is where we thank you. We'll be watching the film, no doubt. And Amal, you stay where you are. Now, just a, a reminder, the documentary Off the Grid, Ghost Citizens, premieres this Saturday at 17.30 GMT here on TRT World. And of course, the YouTube clip will be available as well. Well, as we mentioned, statelessness is not a problem that exists just in Thailand. For various reasons, governments around the world decide to revoke citizenship. Under the spotlight most recently are foreigners in Syria. In the town of Baruz, thousands are fleeing what's left of Daesh's self-declared caliphate. Now, where they can go is up for debate. Let's take a look. <laughs> Well, joining me now from Idlib is the founder of Live Updates from Syria, Tawkir Sharif, whose British citizenship was revoked by the UK government. In London is former Guantanamo Bay detainee Moazem Beg, who's now the director of outreach at CAGE, an advocacy group that controversially campaigned for Anwar al-Awlaki, who later became an al-Qaeda leader, and Mohammed al muazi before he became known as Jihad John. And still with us in London is Amal de Chikera, co-director of the Institute on Statelessness and Inclusion. So now we're looking at another aspect of statelessness, where it gets revoked by governments who decide you don't deserve to be a citizen of this country, and we're going to take away your passport, and we don't want you anymore. Talk here, this happened to you. You're in Idlib right now. You were technically a British citizenship, but Sajid Javid says you're not one anymore. How do you feel about that? And what does that mean practically for your life? Yeah, um, well, hopefully I'm not fully invisible yet, uh, like some of the invisible persons mentioned before. But of course, this has had an adverse effect on my life and I mean I suppose it's highlighting the use of uh, this legislation that's taking place uh, in Britain uh, where racist laws are being used to basically paint everybody with the same brush. Um, for me when I received a letter saying that uh, my citizenship was to be revoked I was very shocked because uh, I'm an aid worker I'm not one of those people who's, you know, escaping from Baruz right now. Um, so I was astounded that, you know, I would be one of those people. Tokir, they say that you traveled to Syria because you were aligned with an Al-Qaeda-aligned group and that you're a threat. The Home Office says you're a threat. Are you a threat at all? No, of course not. I mean, I traveled here in 2012 before the presence of Al-Qaeda here. And... Um, I was an aid worker even before I came to Syria. I was uh, on the Mavi Mamra uh, Freedom Flotilla. I traveled to Gaza also in 2009. So my aid work and exploits are quite well documented. Um, in regards to being aligned to an AQ-aligned group, I mean, the wording is so broad. In the government's own admission, they're admitting that, and they're saying that I'm not uh, a part of IS. They're saying that I'm not even a part of 
uh, Al-Qaeda. They're saying that I'm not even a part of a group that is mm. aligned to Al-Qaeda, so namely uh, HTS or JN, etc. They're saying I'm aligned to them. So, I mean, this is, you know, uh, totally uh, preposterous. I mean, it's not even guilty by association. It's guilt by association with a degree of separation. So, Muazzam, if the government did have something or did have some sort of fair reason, should they have the courage to actually name it and say, this is the organization we think you belong to and this is why? Should they be clearer about what they're claiming here? Well, let's get this into context first. Let's understand that this process has been used arbitrarily um, uh, with the use of secret evidence, evidence that you can't challenge, evidence that your lawyers can't get to see. They are processed through the um, Special Immigrations and Appeals Commissions. And that in itself is a problem in a country that claims to be a bastion of freedom and democracy and human rights and uh, adherence to the rule of law. Uh, if the government has evidence and that evidence needs to be tested properly in a transparent court of law, um, there's no point in bringing 15-year-old narratives of saying somebody's connected to or aligned to, has, as, as Tokyo has said, uh, through a degree of separation to an organization that actually at the time when uh, Tokir was there, was being supported indirectly by the British government because the British government was supplying non-lethal aid to the Free Syrian Army, which was fighting alongside and sharing resources that had been provided by the British government uh, with organizations like Jabhat al-Nusra, right. which later transformed, of course, into H uh, HTS. So, so the, all of this needs to be tested, and you can't arbitrarily remove somebody's nationality and effectively make them stateless, which is against all of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and then say somehow you've protected the British public. Amal de Jacquera, what kind of precedent does this set? I mean, I think it's important to, to ask two questions. I and mean, the first question is, uh, should a state ever have the power to strip citizenship of its citizens? And the second question is, should a state be entitled, if it does have that power, to, to go about doing so in a discriminatory and arbitrary manner? Uh, and I think in answering the first question, we should start with the second, actually. Uh, and if you look at the, the, the legal framework in the UK, it's actually quite interesting and, in, and incredibly, pro incredibly problematic because what it creates essentially are three categories of citizens. If you are a citizen by birth who has no other nationality, you cannot be stripped of your citizenship. If you are a citizen by birth who is also a national of another country, you can be stripped, by, stripped of your citizenship, the, the thinking being that therefore you will not be made stateless. But if you are a naturalized citizen, you can be stripped of your citizenship, even if that would result in you being made stateless. And if you look, I mean, the fact that you have these three categories in it is mm -hmm. in itself discriminatory because it targets people from migrant backgrounds, from minority backgrounds. And if you look at the Shamima Begum case, which was also in the news recently, she actually falls in the first category in that she is a British citizen by birth who has no other nationality. But because of her Bangladeshi heritage, there was an assumption that she also had Bangladeshi mm -hmm. nationality, and she was wrongfully stripped of her citizenship. So there's a, there's a whole range of issues around the fact that the, the law in itself is discriminatory and it allows for arbitrary decisions to be made. But then going back to the first question, uh, I mean, should a state ever be stripping its citizens of their citizenship? This raises a whole range of other questions, particularly in the context of international terrorism and the fight against terror. Right. Because what a state essentially is doing is saying, uh, A, that person X is problematic and we do not want that person back. And B, therefore, that person is not our problem, that person is the problem of the international community. And in terms of cases like Shamima Begum uh, uh, and others, uh, you see the the unfairness in terms of taking the citizenship of a person in terms of their own individual human rights. Right. But also you see the impact in terms of the international community, okay. where the British government has basically washed its hands off okay. its own Okay, so they've washed their hands. Okay, Tokyo, perhaps a parallel. There's a feeling amongst the right, and it's not just because I've been going through some of the, the comments in, in sort of Daily Mail articles and so on, but with Shamima Begum, it's like, well, go back to Bangladesh. We don't want anything to do with you. And with you, maybe a similarity. Well, you're British Pakistani, so you can go to Pakistan. We, we don't want to deal with you, whether you're guilty or innocent. Tell me how you feel about that. You see, the strange thing is I feel as if I've been sold a lie. I mean, if you just listen to my accent, I've got an East London accent. I was born uh, and raised in London. So I'm a Londoner, whether they like it or not. Um, I studied 
in East London. I studied in university in the UK. So, in a sense, I'm British uh, uh, to the core in terms of culture and the things that define me. Even for me, coming out to Syria to help the people was something or good values that I learned uh, in Britain. So, when people say to me, go back to where you come or came from, um, I don't really have a place that I can go back to. I mean, Pakistan, yes, my parents uh, were born in Pakistan, but they also lived most of their life in the UK. I feel many of us feel betrayed because we were sold the lie that we were really British. We had the, the right, uh, the equal right to vote, the equal right to an education, the equal right uh, to due process. Right. And that's something that I'm being denied right now. I'm saying that, okay, if you believe guilty, put me in front of a jury and I will defend myself, right. not in some secret courts. Dr. Okay, I don't want to be presumptuous, and I've read a few articles about you before this interview, but as far as I understand, your wife is with you. She's British as well, and she's white British, if, I, if I'm correct. Has her, her citizenship hasn't been revoked, has it? This is a really uh, interesting question. Yeah, she's mixed race. So uh, one of her grandparents is, is uh, English, oh, okay. um, white. Um, and we feel that may be a reason why she hasn't been revoked. Um, there's other people, for example, Jihadi Jack, who was clearly a fighter with uh, Islamic State or IS, and his citizenship hasn't been revoked, and he's a dual national. He's the only one who's actually, actually saying that I am a dual national. So it seems uh, blatant that there is some kind of far-right uh, racist uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, interpretation or execution of these legislations, which makes many people uneasy. I mean, many MPs in the UK right now, and there's a big conversation going on. People are saying, are we really British or are we sub-British? Is there a two-tier uh, hierarchy system here right. in the UK? So amid this culture war that's taking place against the backdrop of Brexit and talk of immigration and so on, Mozambique, what kind of legal avenues or legal recourse does someone like Tokir have? Well, of course, there have been two cases recently, two uh, people of Bangladeshi origin who had their nationalities revoked and uh, managed to get them back. But that was basically based upon a technicality uh, connected to the one that may uh, affect Shamiba Begum's case. And that is if you haven't applied for Bangladeshi nationality by the time you're the age of 19, um, then you automatically lose that right. Um, I, ironically, uh, I think we need to go back to some of these cases. The, one of the worst, most notorious cases of, of nationality revocation was actually Osama bin Laden. His uh, Saudi nationality was revoked, and let's just say the rest is, the rest is history. Um, the revocation of nationality of people is actually, as I said before, a controversial of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, that no state will arbitrarily remove the nationality of somebody and effectively make them stateless, or in another uh, article it states that they can't be uh, placed into exile. In the case of somebody like uh, Tokir Sharif and others, they have effectively been placed under exile, that they can't go anywhere. There are no embassies uh, where he is of any country, including Pakistan. How do you move pra practically? In, so in de facto terms, you have been made stateless because you mm -hmm. can't even go anywhere uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the freedom of movement that you're supposed to have. Um, uh, in terms of numbers, just so that we understand this, in Britain, uh, Theresa May, as, under her tenure, tenure as, as Home Secretary, uh, removed the nationality of about 36 people in 2014. Mm -hmm. In 2017, the numbers are around 105. Uh, we, from, from what we know, almost the, the, the numbers of those who are Muslims are the far greater majority. And this again tells you, I mean, just look at this. There are many people in the UK who are part of the far right who are descendants of um, people that came from uh, Eastern Europe and so forth. Um, would we be right then in removing their nationality if they're convicted of terrorism crimes and then sent back to where their grandfathers came from uh, in Eastern Europe? Of course that's not happening because that would be seen to apply to the people who are predominantly white and, and Western. And this is only happening to those who are darker skinned, people from Africa primarily or from Asia. And again, you can see from the case of Jack Letts, as, as Tokyo has explained, that this isn't happening to white Westerners, even mm -hmm. if they're part of an organization uh, that has been uh, responsible for the massacre of, of hundreds of, uh, of thousands of people. Tokyo, what's your next move? Um, my next move is to continue helping uh, the Syrian people here. 
I'm always hopeful and I believe that there are good countries out there that, you know, may see that we are bringing value to the people and want to support us and maybe, you know, give me a, a golden citizenship. You never know. <laughs> uh, Amal de Chakera, let me give you the opportunity to kind of wrap us up as you've sort of uh, been with us throughout the journey from talking about the Thai footballers to this right now. Wrap us up, please. Yeah, I mean, I, I would like to just make one final point in terms of wrap up, which is that if we go back to the three categories of citizenship, which effectively are in play now as a result of this legal framework, what we have is a situation of the government saying effectively that if you belong to that first category and you are a terrorist, we will deal with you without stripping you of your citizenship. Uh, because it must mean that a responsible government will still put its national security first regardless of whether you're a dual citizen or not. And then the question is, why can't that same approach be adopted to those who are dual nationals and those who are uh, naturalized citizens? Uh, why cannot those same measures be applied instead of taking that extra inhuman step of depriving someone of their citizenship and, and in the case of Taufik, for example, uh, leaving them in exile? Okay. Amal de Jakera, Tawkir Sharif, and Muazzam Beg. It's been a pleasure having you all on the Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us.